exciting to be here. Here from London, wore the socks so that you would know. So let's start. Let's breathe in and breathe out through the mouth. Breathe in and breathe out. Carry on. And as my teacher said to me, forget to do this, and enlightenment will be the least of your problems. So I'm here to talk about meditation, but kind of not as well. So we all know that meditation is a fantastic biohack, yeah? Um, but there's a problem with meditation, yeah? We are uh, more attention uh, divided than we've ever been before. There are huge amounts of calls on our time. Uh, it's very difficult to have a still mind or a still body with the world that we live in. And all these things mean that the impact is felt on our breathing. So we tend to hold our breath. And one of the great undiagnosed epidemics is the epidemic of overbreathing, of low CO2. Um, <clears throat> I uh, was taught to meditate with my brother, by my dad, when I was very young, so I've been meditating for a long time. And I've been using meditation and mindfulness and breathing with my patients. Uh, for over 20 years. Um, and so this, is, you know, this has really informed my personal journey, my um, therapeutic journey in the clinic. Um, and I went on to form, about 15 years ago, New Medicine Group in London's Harley Street. So at our peak, we were uh, the most experienced team of integrated healthcare therapists in the UK. There was 300 years of clinical practice in the immediate team. And we specialized in seeing people who had seen everyone and done everything, and they would come to us for a different perspective. And we were brought together by a common uh, desire to answer one very specific question, which was, why is it that some people can get ill and then they tend to stay ill, but some people get ill and can recover from almost anything? So we became obsessed with, you know, what is resilience? How do you build and measure and change your personal resiliency? So on this 15-year journey, uh, <clears throat> which led up until the formation of my new company, um, we explored this question. And we looked at what m most people in the modern, economically developed world uh, become ill from. And it's clear that these are essentially diseases of cr chronic preventable inflammation. So heart disease, cardiovascular disease, cancer, obesity, uh, diabetes, uh, complex autoimmune conditions. Uh, all of, if you dig down into all of these, what you find is that they're diseases of inflammation. And if you dig down into that, you find the inflammation in most cases is due to disruption and dysregulation of stress hormones. So because we're living this overly uh, overwhelming life, our response, physiological response to that on a primordial level is to uh, release stress hormones to cope, and that has a very strong pro-inflammatory uh, response. So what are the biomarkers we can use to assess how, uh, how stressed we are, how uh, our resiliency is doing? Now, I'm sure many people here, biohackers, I've been using heart rate variability for some time. In, in many ways, you guys kind of really uh, push it into the mainstream. But um, I mean, as fantastic as uh, HRV is as, a, as a, um, a measurement of both physical and mental stamina, can we go deeper? You know, what is it that drives heart rate variability? You know, what is the um, ultimate metric? for determining most of the self-regulatory processes in the body. And we believe it's the vagus nerve. Yeah, now coming, you know, pe most people hadn't heard of the vagus nerve a year or two ago. A lot of people now have. It's still much misunderstood. It's the, you know, the master uh, part of the autonomic nervous system which connects the gut and the brain. So it is literally the physical embodiment of the gut-brain uh, connection. It passes through all the viscera and the organs on the way, and it regulates most of the autonomic nervous system functions which are vital for your own personal resilience. 
Um, the vagal tone uh, is, is, you know, that's the metric we're trying to um, capture yeah, and, how, and, and improve for people in, in, in real time. Uh, you, can tone vagal, um, uh, you can tone a nerve in the same way you would tone a muscle by doing particular practices. The difference is that with muscles, they atrophy as soon as you stop using them. With nerves, you're laying down a neural network. Yeah, every time you do a particular uh, practice uh, if, um, um, it, that has an effect on the nervous system, you're making that neural network more robust. And over time, that then ends up being the default. So rather than a panic and stress reaction being the default, you can build a, a default neural network around the, um, around the um, relaxation response. And this is really relevant because um, from an evolutionary biological perspective, our um, forefathers, our blueprint, were essentially people who were hardwired for stress and anxiety. So, you know, all the laid back, relaxed early humans didn't make it. You know, the ones that, um, um, uh, you know, uh, did make it were the slightly paranoid, the slightly anxious, the overly worried, the ones that did worry what was behind that bush, the ones that did put the food aside, who hoarded um, for winter. These are the guys that made it, and these, you know, we have come from that blueprint. So the human blueprint is essentially one of stress and anxiety. Um, and which is obviously then relevant to what we do with the, the rest of our time. Um, but the difference is, of course, so, you know, we're in this very technological world now. So uh, uh, exponential technological change is now completely out of pace with human evolutionary development. So although we may have exchanged wolves and bears for uh, AI and the smartphones, our primordial brain is still perceiving threat in the environment from any source which is overwhelming or overstimulating. And what this leads to is mental and physical hypervigilance. So excess perception of threat in the environment. And your um, survival response really has only one uh, mechanism to deal with that, which is the release of stress hormones to activate the survival emergency flight, fight, freeze response. And as I said, these are highly pro-inflammatory. They're designed for use in short bursts when the body has a lot of them over time. There's a lot of inflammation and a lot of corrosive damage from that. Um, <clears throat> and then about 10 years ago, I started to notice in clinic that a lot of patients uh, were changing. I, I, I saw the advent of what I've called the dark side of mindfulness. So, I mean, I, for years, people have been saying to me, oh, I can't meditate. Uh, when I try to meditate, my mind's too busy, I can't sit still. This is the very, very common uh, belief amongst people, they can't meditate. You know, even with apps, so I try to use the whatever app and I, my mind's still too busy. Uh, but this was very different. This was a very different new thing I started to see in patients, where they actually would say, no, it's not that I can't meditate, it's when I try to relax, I feel worse. When I n notice my breathing, I get a panic attack. When I try to sit still, I want to run out of the room. So this was a group of people, a substantial group of people, who were literally neurologically unable to meditate, let alone relax. And, you know, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I suspect, you know, there's people in the room that know exactly what I'm talking about. And it's not surprising, is it? So if somebody, if we have this hypervigilant mind, this mind which is constantly perceiving threat in the environment, yeah, it's looking, is that a stick or is that a snake? Oh, snake, snake. Yeah, it's seeing threat where no actual threat exists. Then if you ask someone to sit still, you ask them to close their eyes, to notice their body, to relax and breathe out, and of course they're going to notice quite how tense and anxious and how poor their breathing is, and they're going to want to run out of the room screaming. So I ended up with this position where these tools that I'd spent a lifetime developing and learning of mindfulness and breathing and uh, meditation were no longer relevant for a significant proportion of the people that I was seeing, and actually for the people that I really wanted to help most, because nothing else worked for them. So <clears throat> I then had to work out what I was going to do. Uh, so I chose to become part of a global movement 
that's interested in building a world that's less full of fear. So if the problem is hypervigilance, yeah, the process of being afraid of danger, the uh, biological primordial mechanism whereby we see threats that doesn't really exist, then I believe the solution is what, what we call uh, adaptogenic resiliency. Yeah, so your personal ability to um, self-regulate subconsciously in the moment and moment by moment. Yeah? So essentially the ability to roll with the punches, whatever those punches might be, because we don't know what life's going to throw at us. And it's the inability to adapt that causes suffering. It's the inability to adapt that leads to trauma and PTSD, which is a major part of what my clinic treats. So from clinical experience, we were able to determine that there were three vital components that any solution of this nature had to have if it was going to be global and scalable. It had to be easy, because if it wasn't easy, people wouldn't do it. It had to be enjoyable, because if it's not enjoyable, people won't repeat it. Uh, and then the barrier to entry through training and expertise had to be low, otherwise people would see it as insurmountable. So we'd been using a variety of uh, technology in the clinic um, based around sound. We'd got more and more sophisticated. And one day I was sitting on uh, one of our items, and uh, I realized that we could use the existing tech to build a wearable device which would um, be mobile, which we could scale globally. And you know, we feel fear. We don't think fear. So how do you communicate to a lizard brain, to a primordial brain, which is in a state of hypervigilance when you can't use words? You have to use felt sense. And it so happens that human beings have this exquisitely evolved and developed sense of vibration. In fact, it was our first ever sense. Before we had any other sense organs, before we had eyes or ears, we would have squidged around, um, feeling our way around the environment by vibration. You know, can I eat that? Can I sleep with that? Should I run away from that? So we have, the sense of vibration is hardwired into every cell in our body more than any other, in any other sense. And we've had a vagus nerve for 400 million years, whereas we've only had a human brain for a million or so. Yeah? So vibration and the vagus nerve are intimately related and hardwired more than anything else. So I had this, 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 this realization that we could miniaturize the tech, we could put it on the chest, and we could turn the body into the hardware. Um, so we use infrasound, yeah, low-frequency sound. Most people know of ultrasound, high-frequency sound. We use low-frequency sound in particular wave patterns, synchronized with audio components through headphones. And this turns the um, hollow a thoracic chamber into a resonating sound cell. And it's very similar to oming and chanting, very similar to gong, uh, gong workshops, etc. except it's much more localized. People around you can't hear it, uh, and you can do it anywhere. And isn't it interesting how human beings have found ways to make their chest and body resonate and vibrate for thousands of years, you know, with chanting and oming and mantra, things that will actually make the chest physically vibrate? Um, so we uh, started using this, we developed a beta version, we used it on thousands of sessions in the clinic. Uh, the feedback was remarkable, and so we ended up developing it into a commercial product, uh, which is the Sensate platform, the hardware and the app that we use today. But we're here to learn, yeah, um, you know, I'm very much on a kind of outreach journey. Um, we're increasingly, um, we, have a, we have a Californian office, uh, which is open or was open until recent events. Um, but, you know, there's a fantastic, I think Helsinki is particularly advanced in terms of biohacker um, presence, which is great for us. So, you know, we're here to learn, we're here to teach. Uh, please come and see us on the stand, say hello, pop us uh, an email uh, on one of the social channels. Uh, there is a secret perk for, for biohacker uh, sum, uh, summit attendees um, where you can order the device if you wish to. Uh, just come and ask us about it. Thank you very much.